Yeah, very briefly, my name is Mark Meckler. I'm the president of the Convention of States Project. I'm, I'm actually based in Austin, Texas. I escaped the People's Republic of California. I had to move last year. <laughs> it's an honor to be here with you today. And I do say that in every committee, I have the opportunity to testify. But it's a particular honor to be here for me because this is the birthplace of liberty. We are here in Pennsylvania where it all began. And we are here because we aim to save this experiment, this incredible, unique experiment of a republic that was given to us. And Dr. Franklin famously stated when asked what, what the people have been given, he said, a republic, if you can keep it. And when he said you, he didn't mean the elite. He didn't mean politicians in, in a city far away. He meant you, specifically you. He meant us. But specifically, he meant you sitting here before me today. There's something very unique about your role in our system of governance. I travel all over the country. I ask state legislators this question regularly. I ask, what is your role in the United States federal government? And I'll tell you the answer that I most often get from state legislators is a blank stare. And when you, after you take your oath of office and you come here for your orientation and they show you where the restrooms are and the cafeteria and the caucus rooms, Nobody tells you what your role is in the United States federal government. I've never met a state legislator that's been taught this. And the answer is you actually have the singular, most important, most powerful role of anybody in the United States government. Now, if that sounds like hyperbole, I'm going to back it up. I'm going to remove that for you because you are the only people in our entire system of governance that actually possess the power to call a convention, to propose amendments, and to ratify amendments, thereby changing the structure of our system of governance. The president doesn't have that power. Congress wasn't given that power. The courts, though they sometimes usurp that power, were never intended to have that power. But you were given that power. It's a question I've asked myself many times. Why? Why you, of all people? And again, when I say you, I'm referring to you specifically sitting here in this room. Why were you given that power? And I think if you look at our history, the answer is fairly obvious. Because the men who crafted this Constitution were you. They sat in your seats. They sat in state legislatures. They sat on city councils and county boards. They knew government close to the American people, and they designed a system with a fail-safe that involved you because they knew you would be close to the American people. Did they think that you would be better than the folks in the federal government? No. Did they think that people were going to be perfect at the state level? Absolutely not. But did they prefer government close to the people? Of course, they absolutely did. And the entire system of governance was designed to put the ultimate power in your hands. Why? Because they predicted the future. Not because they had a crystal ball, but because they understood human nature. And they understood that when you centralize power, power will always accrete power to itself. That's human nature for all of human history. It didn't begin with Washington, D.C., and it doesn't end there. Human beings, when they have power, they bring more power to themselves, and they knew that the central government would become more and more powerful, and they had to create a mechanism whereby you, on behalf of the American people, could take that power away. You know, in that room in Philadelphia and and in that steamy summer on September 15th, two days before the end of the convention, September 15th, 1787, Colonel George Mason stood and he addressed the men that were assembled in that room. I want you to imagine yourselves. Have you heard the story? It's hot. It's steamy. The windows are boarded up. They don't have air conditioning. They're ready to go home. It's two days before the end of convention. And Mason says, we have a terrible problem with the document we've drafted. We've given the power to the federal government to propose amendments. But we've not given the same power to the people acting through the states. And then he asked a question, and I think that question has to be asked today. Are we so naive that we believe that a federal government that becomes a tyranny will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? You know, I hear people chuckle. I see people up there smile. I'm pretty sure that we don't have videotape that they laughed and smiled probably slapped their foreheads there in 1787. And there's a reason I'm so sure about it. I'm not just surmising. Madison's notes are extraordinary. If you've read them, they're incredibly detailed. Everything that was said in that room is, is discussed in Madison's notes. And Madison's notes at this place reflect two very short words in Latin. Nin, com. In Latin, that means no comment. There's no 
debate. If you've read the debates, they debated everything. Everything was debated, right? How the debate should be conducted is debated. But on this point, there is no disagreement. All of the delegates present agree that we have to give the power to the states. And that proposition is made to add the second clause of Article 5, giving you the power to act on behalf of the people of your state to take power away from the federal government should it become tyrannical. And then there's a vote taken, and that vote is unanimous. The only thing with no debate that makes it into the Constitution unanimously is the idea that you, sitting here today, will have the power to take power away from the federal government. I think it's extraordinary. That's the history. Fast forward to today. We all know the federal government's out of control. Whatever your party is, whatever your ideology is, we're not happy with what's going on in Washington, D.C. Their approval rating is somewhere around typhoid, right? And so we know we have to do something about it, and you've been given the power to do something about it. There's a couple of things that I want to address before we close that came up in Mr. Schlafly's remarks. The first is I have to speak on behalf of my very dear friend, Senator Tom Coburn. Senator Coburn was supposed to be here today. Uh, he's suffering from advanced cancer. He couldn't make it today, unfortunately. And I hope you will keep him in, his, in your prayers as, as we do. I think he's the greatest living American statesman today. He's a man who had the strongest conservative rating of any senator in the Senate for his entire tenure in the Senate. And the idea that somehow he was slandered here today because he left office two years early is an outrage that I can't leave unanswered. He is a great American hero who has given most of his adult life to the service of this country. And he left the Senate two years early because he did not believe he could fix the problems that ail the country from the Senate. And he chose to engage in something that he believed was for posterity, which was the Convention of States Project. So he could actually do something useful instead of participating in the noise that is Washington, D.C. today. So I stand in defense of Dr. Coburn. If Dr. Coburn... Thank you. If Dr. Coburn were here today, he would tell you this. The federal government now on book is roughly $40 trillion in debt. It's over $140 trillion in debt if you look at the off-book liabilities. And we are going to crash this country. End of story. We are going to crash this country into the abyss. And they are not going to do anything about it in Washington, D.C., there are a lot of attacks on us made. I'm, I'm going to answer two more of the attacks, and then I'll take questions. One is, who's funding this? Any of you at any time are welcome to visit our very fancy corporate offices in my house in Texas, in my personal home office off the kitchen, where all the billionaires apparently come visit me. It's an outrage and a slander. And this kind of slanderous politics takes this discussion to some place it should not go, which is frankly, it's just slander and innuendo. It's, it's gutter politics. And I don't believe in it. I, I'm not going to challenge what Andy's motivations are. I think Mr. Schlafly's motivations are pure and good. I can tell you who my donors are. See, because the person that raises the money for the organization in this organization is my wife of 26 years, who works in the office next to mine who has raised money from over 80,000 individual grassroots patriots all over this country. So if those are the millionaires and billionaires that Mr. Schlafly is afraid of, well, he might want to talk to the grandmas who send me checks and say it's five bucks a month out of my fixed income, and I'm sorry I can't afford anymore. Again, an outrageous slander on the tens of thousands of people supporting this movement. And the last is this. He read testimony from his mother, who I think was one of the greatest women ever in American politics, Phyllis Schlafly, an incredible woman. She said something very wrong and I think very demeaning to the people of this country in the testimony he read that there are no Madisons and Adams and Washingtons. That is a lie. I travel this country. I've been in 47 states in the last two years. I meet them everywhere I go. Sometimes they're a checker in a grocery store. Sometimes they're a fireman. Sometimes they're a scholar at a university. Often, they're sitting in, sitting in committees like this all over the country. The people I've met, I'd put them in a room with the founders any day. And by the way, I would include Mrs. Schlafly among them where she's still alive. And so I think it's outrageous and offensive to say that we, the American people, can no longer handle our own government. I believe we can. I believe in the American people. Thank you. Representative Gobbler. Woo. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I, I wish we did have six hours for this testimony, but uh, unfortunately we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to be quick. I, I've got four questions. I'm going to ask one. Um, I wanted to ask something that I think goes to the core of the question as to are we playing with fire? Because you ready for the argument as it goes is a convention cannot be limited, the, the opposition argument. So if a convention cannot be limited then the subject matter of an application, which is what H.R. 206 and S.R. 243 are, are applications to Congress, then the subject matter of those applications don't matter. And in that case, we already have, I believe on the books, over 12,000 applications that have been sent to Congress on different specific little subjects over the years. So my question is, if the subject matter of an application doesn't matter, then why don't we already have a convention? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. It goes to the heart of the matter. The, the actual number of official applications uh, to Congress for a convention of states is in excess of 400, is the, the number that have actually been submitted. 12,000 proposed, 400 there, yeah, 400 actually, yep. yep. And so I just wanted to clarify that because those are the ones that have been submitted, and Congress gets to look at those and decide if we have a convention. And obviously, it takes 34 to get to convention. If there's over 400, why aren't we at convention? And the answer is because it is unequivocal, decided, that there, are, there is a limiting factor, according to Congress itself, according to the courts, that these applications have to match. In other words, they have to aggregate. They have to be close enough that, that it's clear that two-thirds of states wish to call a convention on the same subject matter, and that is the limiting subject matter of the convention. And if I may add one more detail, um, could you address the difference between Warren Burger? William Rehnquist and John Roberts, because we had some discussion about the chief justice, which was one specific chief justice, right. um, and, and and maybe address how uh, the courts, based on who may be sitting in that chair, may look at the question of limiting a convention a little differently, and, and maybe what the motivations might have been for uh, someone at a specific point in history to uh, take the view that he did. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. I, I've studied the letter from uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger. I have respect for every person who's ever achieved that seat, anybody on the Supreme Court, and especially a chief justice. But it's important to understand the judicial ideology of the person who is writing a letter and where it comes from. And it's, there's an irony here. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly, probably the greatest fighter for the right to life in American history, certainly one of the pioneers of that. Chief Justice Warren Burger, the, the chief justice who signed and delivered to us Roe versus Wade. These two people stand, obviously, philosophically as the antithesis of each other in their political philosophies. And he's being asked this question at a time when many states have proposed an Article 5 convention specifically for the purpose of overturning Roe versus Wade, the seminal decision of his entire career. And he is asked, what do you think about the idea of a convention? Well, he is going to protect the legacy rationally of his own court and say, that would be a terrible idea. Why would we want to hold a convention? So I think it's important. Contact is important here. And so to me, that letter from what I would consider one of the most uh, wildly progressive uh, interpretationalist uh, jurists ever to sit on the Supreme Court, I, I think we should look at who it comes from, and I think it tells us the truth about his opinion. Uh, Chairman, thank you so much. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. The biggest concern that we've heard raised today is that an Article 5 convention of the states could become a runaway convention. Um, what I've heard most often uh, as a concern is potential changes to the Second Amendment. And can you concisely explain how we can address the fears of those who believe an Article 5 Convention of States would become a runaway convention? Sure. The, the simplest way is through the ratification process. And it's just math. And you've got to forgive me, I'm a lawyer, so I'm not great at math, but I can go this, this high. It takes 38 states to ratify any amendment pros, proposed by the convention. And uh, contrary to, to what Mr. Schlafly said, y yes, they absolutely could put it to state ratifying conventions, which would be designed by you as the state legislature. So ultimately, the state legislatures control the ratification process. If you flip that math on its head, it takes only 13 states to stop the ratification of any amendment that the American people don't like. And I can tell you this, because I've run the math on every possible amendment you can imagine, whether it could come from the left or the right, uh, whether it could be down the middle. It's pretty easy to find 13 to stop almost anything. And I do not mean this, and I hope you won't take offense by this, but as you know, in a legislature, the easiest thing for a legislature to do is nothing, is to not do something, right? That's the least controversial position. And the way to not ratify an amendment is to 
do nothing. And so uh, specifically to the Second Amendment, because I hear this one all the time and I've heard it a lot here in this state, sitting on my board is Chuck Cooper, who is Reagan's personal constitutional attorney. He's litigated the Second Amendment for the NRA all the way up to the level of the, cons of the Supreme Court for 30 years. And he says there cannot be a runaway convention. The Second Amendment is not at risk. But ratification is the protective process. And I know we're really short on time, and I have so many questions I'd love to ask you, but I just, to sort of close things up, what are your thoughts on the countermand amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which, if approved, would give states the ability to override federal legislation, executive orders, court orders, whenever 30 states agree to such a vote? Have, have yeah, you On a personal on level, that? I like the idea that the states get some sort of override. I don't know what the right uh, balance is between number of states uh, versus the federal government. The countermand or some kind of a countermand amendment would be available for discussion uh, within our proposed convention. Very good. Thank you. Uh, once again, Chairman Everett, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. Uh, we've heard a lot of really good information today. Uh, we've received a copious amount of information in the hearing packet. I think it's about 130 pages. I'm looking forward to reviewing all of the information and continuing the conversation to everyone who's here today. It's really wonderful to see a packed hearing room. We really appreciate your interest in, in our state government. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Go to conventionofstates.com, press the button, sign the petition. More importantly, get 10 of your friends to do the same. When you sign the petition, then that sends a letter to your state legislator. You go on the list in their district as a supporter. We deliver those lists to the state legislators. It means something to them.